I'm here speaking with Mary Anna. She is a longtime practitioner of Tai Chi and a tango dancer. And I wanted to have a conversation with her about her shin ankles. So thank you for joining me, Mariana. Welcome. Oh, thank you. In fact, I just got back from Tai Chi class just before this and doing the one-legged kicks. And what I do when I feel it's hard coming is just concentrate there. And usually I can overcome any imbalances and and do them. And it's remarkable because I couldn't do that just a month ago. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so, I mean, in your email to me, you're talking about how both your tango tango instructor and your Tai Chi instructor were talking mm -hmm. about like they could see it, but they didn't know how to get you there. That like, the movement wasn't yeah. little. Can you talk about that? A little no, bit? I mean, well, my the, the, my current tango teacher just wanted me to practice on standing, you know, on one foot and doing pivots on, of course, on one leg. And I had never, I did like to practice that because I couldn't do it without holding on to someone. So the, the, the teacher told me to practice, but I'm not one to want to practice something that I can't see results from. Yeah. So yeah. being in the emphasis on the shin ankle was just, it all of a sudden flipped the switch. Yeah. For and me. that's a frustrating part when um, you're told like to do more of something that you know is just not. It, it, it has never made sense to me to practice something wrong. And, and that's especially in Tai Chi and doing the standing pose. I got corrected by teachers, but I didn't like doing that until I could feel it in my body. I didn't like just physically standing there for 30 minutes and doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. That made no sense to me. You could feel that something was wrong. Right? Yeah. But in, even that takes work because I come from a long line of not trying not to feel because I didn't want pains and hurts to interfere with my doing something physical that I wanted to do. Mm. So yeah. a, it is a very strange world, I believe, figuring out how the body works. I, and my background does comes from long time martial arts i do I, and lifting weights and yoga and anything and everything that i could do to to tame it to get it under control and literally it balance was the problem from the beginning even yoga and standing in the tree pose i could never do that equally on both sides and i could never do it very well at all and i guess i should tell you i am now 77 years old Oh, wow. And I probably am better physical condition than I've ever been. That You know, the balance thing is so huge and to practice. And that's what they teach a lot with improving your balance, right? They'll tell mm -hmm. you to stand on one foot. And that's if you're gripping, it, yeah. you're just increasing that mm -hmm. poor habit. So instead mm -hmm. of giving you something different to do, or they'll put you on an unstable surface which makes you grip it even more. So you're not more. in yeah. a place of um, understanding yeah. what balance is. Yeah. Where I practice Tai Chi in the backyard, it, it isn't very even. I can feel every stick and, yeah. and bolt, you know, there. So I, I do it. Side. But it's interesting to me. I, I see a reflexologist who fortunately has helped me tremendously with way more than balance. And I also see a woman who's a nutritionist. And it, it was just three, two or three weeks ago that my tango teacher really remarked how much better my balance was. Actually, I do have two, two different teachers and both of them have said the same thing. All of a sudden, it's way better. And uh, they didn't realize I've been working on it for years. But point of this is that the tango teacher thinks it's because I'm practicing pivots. My nutritionist said, oh, well, the, the stuff you've been taking is to help your balance. And the reflexology guy said the adjustments he made last time were specifically for balance. And I'm thinking, oh, everybody looks at this from their own perspective. Yeah, right. right. And I guess it's I'm the one that has to look at it from a total perspective. So I know I've done a lot and concentrated on it tremendously. Yeah. And, and a lot of it is confidence, believing I can do it. I think that's probably, that, obviously, that's a big point.
Yeah. But, well, the whole idea of standing is it's it's not something that anyone does for you. That is one thing yeah. that you do for yourself. Yeah. You, know, you could be on a table and receive treatment. But when you're standing and walking, you bring on all the patterns that you've always had. And so in order to make a big change, even if someone makes a big change, particularly on your feet, a lot of times it doesn't endure because you go right back to the entire postural patterns that got you there. I did want to tell you, and it's really neat to be able to talk to someone who understands <laughs> more the whole picture. I mean, I, I've studied martial arts. This is about 40 years now. And obviously all of them want you to do the um, standing posture, the mountain pose. Mm -hmm. And what kept me mostly from that is the hips, the pelvis turning under a little bit. And people describe that differently. I am seeing that what I've learned and tried to fix in my body in the pelvis area and the posture where I'm always up with, it's not a tension. It is a, that's about, but that's the best word I can come up with to describe it. It's my arms aren't flat, aren't flat, aren't just blah. When I'm doing something, I'm in those arms, they're connected. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned, again, from Taiko. Uh, I, I almost had to overcome being a noodle in yoga mm -hmm. to having um, some tensegrity. Yeah, I, that's the word. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And now when I watch people do Tai Chi, and especially the Yang style, being slow and like it is, I see how off they are, how disconnected they are. Just like when I started martial arts 40 years ago, the, the, the Chinese teacher who was here in the States from China looked at me and he said I was not connected. Mm -hmm. But the problem was he couldn't tell me how to connect. I was going to say. And there's no thing, I mean, yeah. literally, that is what started everything. But there's no single way, as you've seen from all my stories of yoga and everything to tango and et such, there's no single way to do it. But uh, you're using your three keys together as one system. Well, I wanted to mention that. And that's why I got into the pelvis, because I understand how to doing that. And the keys of the shins and the pelvis. And, but the head, that is a little bit different for me, because I've, of course, been taught to, from the crown up, and I, I think I accomplished that from my standpoint of keeping my body up out of the joints rather than settling, letting everything settle way down. So at the base of the skull, uh, mm -hmm. those proprioceptors at the base of the skull, they're, they're designed to respond to pressure. So to pull yourself up high, dancers use that imagery, but that yeah, imagery- it's common there's a lot of room for interpretation and a lot of people will pull their chin down to do that. I mean, it's not precise enough. A lot of movement people don't have hands-on experience. So they don't know what feels like in a body when tension accumulates yeah. and they don't know the path and the connectivity from the heel all the way up to your sphenoid that holds your eyes. Mm -hmm. So if you could think of your cheekbones elevating a little bit, you will start to use the AO joint, which is the joint that your head rests on, on top of the spine so that you're not using a lot of people will end up, you know, where people get adductors hump. Yeah. Yeah. That because they're moving their head from down here, right? They're not using enough of that top joint there. They're not being precise enough. A lot of, when you look at someone from the outside and you're trying to help them feel their body from the inside, it's a very, very complicated thing. And it can be full of misinterpretation and misperception because you're only looking at it from the outside. When you feel the body from the inside, from feeling bodies change, you get a totally different understanding of how a body organizes itself. Yeah. That's one of the reasons, one of the people in the program, she's a ballet teacher. And she said that pelvis, that knowledge, there's all this controversy and how to hold the pelvis, but the pelvis is not one big thing. 
it is three mm -hmm. separate bones. And when you mm -hmm. understand the movement of them and the differentiation of them, that helps you find your the rest of the pelvis. And I think for me, that came into place because of the emphasis on pulling up the abs in front. So mm -hmm. if those come up, then the back has to go down. For some people. For, for some, some people, people, yeah. Some, yeah, some people, when they're, when they're tucked and they're already holding their abs in, it's going to help them to reach your sacrum back. That they get more mm -hmm. response from that. So it depends on where you're coming from. That's why single descriptive do this action versus feel something. If you aim not to follow directions and do A, B, C, but you aim to feel something, you do something and the aim is to find a feeling at the end. When you do that, then you start to self-discover. You start to say, oh, if I do a little bit like this, can I find that? Can I feel the sticky feet? Can I get to the gecko feet? Can I get to these places? And in Tai Chi, in general, can I feel that energy source? Can I feel the Dantian? I have so many longtime Tai Chi practitioners tell me they understood the concept, but they never felt it. Felt it. No. And that is so, that is so right. My teacher in DC, he had such a control of energy that if he'd tell me to do something, he could put energy or whatever where I actually felt it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could tell me what to do, but then I could feel it. As many years as I studied martial arts and tried to feel the Dantian, you know, I didn't. I didn't. I, I do now more than ever, but I, I still suppose I want some brilliant neon light to go off and say, aha, you're there, you know. But it's the feeling because people come from 360 different directions and to get them all into a balanced position where you're comfortable you can't use the same directions. Exactly. exactly. I finally understand that. That's, exactly. And how did you get there? I, I mean, I, like, it's, you know, it's oh, taken me 40, 50 years. <laughs> well, one, I touch bodies for a living. I do this for oh, a living. living. That's one thing. Yeah. So my goal was different from the beginning. My goal from the beginning was all about the feelings, about the feelings and the emotion and the interface between that. And not everybody is focused mm -hmm. that way. Or when they're working with the body, they get hyper-focused in the anatomy and the details of that. And they start to uh, lose the forest for the trees. Or yeah. if someone's okay. looking at the emotional piece and then they go down the psychological thread, they're pretty vague in the body. They It's a lot to study, right? But for mm -hmm. me, I at one point, there was a separation. Do I learn more about the body or more about psychology? What should I do? And for me, the body is so concrete and so specific and psychology. There's a lot of theory out there that is, is kind of a guessing game. And so for me, I was looking for a more theoretical framework that can emerge out of the biology and out of the concreteness and the, um, the outcomes that you can get from the biology. So I, I was really outcome fo focused that kind of kept me in a container. So I didn't spin off into uh, a theory without an application that kept me on path, I would say, because for me, it was all about the feeling. How can you feel? How can you feel whole? How can you feel centered within yourself? How can you access this deep level of calm? And you just find a deeper and deeper level. You just keep going deeper and deeper. And it's pretty cool. Like I said, the changes have been remarkable when I look back over the whole thing. But it's funny. My career was in computers and math, and I'm very structured. But, comes through the thing. <laughs> okay. well, I'll tell you, one of the things is I started looking at the body as an information process. Ah. And so I started asking myself, what information is the body looking for? What is it missing? How can I help it find what it needs? I'll send you the link to that. So that post that I wrote a long time ago, um, because that took me down a different path. Like I studied sound therapy and I studied vision and how that organizes our body. And so those three together triangulate your center point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's neat. What you're describing is the way outcome oriented and feelings. That's always been the watchword. I feel. And when I don't feel, then I have to really, really figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. did, you're a computer scientist. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Right. If it's A, then B, then C. I mean, that's the way it should, quote, be, but uh, not always. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's always that variable Z, which is everything else. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and that's a place like the further you go, there's always going to be that, that, you know, plus the leftovers. It's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. it's the thing that's gotten me so much, and again, it's something more esoteric is that my world depends upon my perception and and i may not perceive the truth but it's the truth according to me and yours is yours in terms of perception i'll send you two articles one is about the information process of the body the other is about filters of perception ah. so yeah i think you'll mm -hmm. enjoy those